Air Commodore Darren Webb is in charge of operations at managed isolation and quarantine. I asked him why the fishing crews have been sharing rooms at Christchurch's Sedema Hotel. I'm impression that double bunking certainly isn't sharing uh, the same bunk, but it's a, it's a twin share and that's quite commonplace. We, uh, we often have people coming back through our facilities um, sharing rooms. That's very normal. Um, but they would the, be family members, wouldn't they, AC Webb? They'd be family members or people who had an association with each other. This is a disparate group yeah. of people who are in isolation. Part of the deal was that they home self-isolated at home for two weeks before coming here. So it's a bit different, isn't it? I wouldn't say it that way. I think these are uh, non-disparate. These are crew members of, of a ship, of a fishing scenario who uh, work, you know, in close confines with each other. So it's it's perfectly logical to imagine them uh, sharing facilities. It is a large number of them, and when we're looking at the capacity of the Sedema, and we need to think clearly about how we would manage our potential need for quarantine space. And so the best way to do that was to have, um, as we have done, a specific wing set aside and secure for um, a potential quarantine breakout in there, and then the remaining space have made available for um, for the the total volume of people arriving. So that's how we've set it up. So in terms of shared rooms, did you put people together who had shared um, the same aisle on a plane or who were going to the same fishing boat? Because these crew are being brought in by more than one fishing company, so they're not all necessarily going to be working side by side on the same boat in the end, are they? Uh, potentially not, and I don't have those specific details, but um, if people are sharing a room, you know, they're essentially they're sharing a bubble, they'll operate in that regime and, uh, and we'll just work it from there. I don't see it as a particularly large concern. Well, in hindsight, would you make changes to that? Because you're exposing a greater number of people, aren't you? Um, we're just looking at the best way to manage the total footprint inside that facility. I think the, uh, the decision-making at the time was to say we are bringing in people from a place like Russia, um, we know that there are large outbreaks around the world. Let's contain them to an exclusive use facility, this one location, and uh, and that's the way we've devised the uh, the scenario. So it's a space consideration is the reason that they're sharing rooms. It's not that it's best protocol for managing uh, potential infection. Oh, it's partly. There's, there's always a range of considerations. What is the primary consideration here in choosing to put them in rooms together? Is it because of the size of the sedema and the number of people you're coming in? So we're looking to maximise the, uh, the throughput of these uh, fishermen onto their vessels, um, creating uh, the required space in there and managing them both in a, in a managed isolation and having potential for quarantine. So, so uh, when you're looking at that um, as a mechanism to, to see them through, through 14 days and safely out the other side, that's that's the decision that was taken. So is it a maximum of two people in a room? That's correct. And do different rooms mix with each other? Would there be any areas that they share together? No, that's, that's not correct. So they are uh, obviously operating under the normal managed isolation uh, protocols. And so, well, how do you control that? How do you know that they haven't been in a corridor together or been in a common area together? So that's just our normal systems operating just as they should, Lisa. So we have um, all of the normal staff on site, the hotel staff, the security staff, the health staff. Um, People spend the majority of their time in their rooms. We're obviously mindful that um, there is a need to give them some space. They, uh, They need to get their exercise in accordance with normal Bill of Rights Act and health requirements, and so that is managed through the normal systems. And, uh, and of course, we also have these people who may need to have cigarette breaks, and so we have a facility set up to support that as well. So how are you managing that then, when people have cigarette breaks? How are you managing them keeping their distance? Presumably they are walking down the same corridors. Are they sharing the same lifts or stairwells? Yeah, I wouldn't want people to think that there's any different um, scenario going on inside this facility compared to anywhere else. This is a normal managed isolation and quarantine site, so we have very careful management of their movement. Close contact definitions, as Dr Bloomfield has described, you know, 15 metres and two, uh, 15 minutes and two metres separation. So those things are very carefully controlled. We will have time limitations set upon uh, where they can go into the smoking area and then uh, escort it back into their rooms. Would there be a scenario, or has there been a scenario, where two people who share a room come downstairs for a smoke break, they're in a smoking area, and then there are other people from other rooms in that smoking area, albeit two metres apart from them? Well, if they're maintaining the two metre separation, that's in accordance with the IPNC guidelines, and so that would be managed through the normal systems.
And in terms of elevators, stairwells, common areas, are the staff in the Sedema using those same common areas or do they have a separate elevator, separate stairs? Each, um, each location is set up to meet its own specific needs. Of course, these are set up as hotels, not as prisons. Um, off the top of my head across, uh, I don't have a visual picture of every 32 facility. I couldn't tell you if um, the Sedema has set aside specific lifts for staff and returnees. If they do have a need to use conjoined facilities, they have very careful cleaning protocols, and so um, that is just a normal part of the operational process. Yeah, but the thing is you had really you had very careful cleaning protocols at the ridges as well and you had very careful cleaning protocols when someone touched a rubbish bin and pre- seems got COVID-19 and also from the ridges um, button in the elevator. So you don't know whether staff and these um, fishing crews are, are using the same lift, same stairwell, these common areas. If there's a need to, Lisa, they will just follow those agreed protocols and we're learning as as, as we go. So, for example, um, the lift button scenario, we've learned that um, additional hygiene and cleaning requirements were set. Those uh, signages were put up and those facilities were made available. So if that's uh, been been uh, needed in the city, then that certainly would be in place. You've acknowledged that obviously the people arriving, these fishing crews, have arrived from a country that has very high levels of coronavirus, but you are operating the Sedema exactly the same as all your other isolation and quarantine facilities. Is that correct? You didn't think there needed to be stronger protocols? Um, we're really confident with our protocols, Lisa. They've been proven effective for nearly 63,000 New Zealanders coming through over the last seven months. Um, what we did do, though, is ensure that um, some of the additional considerations based on the returnee cohort were thought through. So this is an exclusive use purely for the Russian and Ukrainian, so there are no other returnees associated in this place. And we've also gone to the extent of uh, translating our welcome pack and our messaging into Russian so that we can communicate effectively with them. And what about communicating on a day-to-day basis? Like if staff have to say, could you please move f- further apart? This is where you're supposed to have your cigarette break. Um, someone's dropping food outside in the hallway for you. How many Russian speakers do you have on site? Yes, yeah, good point. So um, so we've um, thought that through and, and we do have translators on site and, um, and certainly the first uh, couple of days we've realised that we need to do more. So we've brought in additional translator support and that's proven to be really effective. So how many did you have to start off with and how many do you have now? Um, I think we had two to start with and we've now got four. Given that some people are infected at the Sedema, what does that mean for the whole group in terms of the length of stay they are now facing? Yeah, we're working that through with, with health and we're closely thinking about uh, exactly what that means. There are um, you know, processes uh, because going into quarantine is commonplace. We've had uh, quarantine activities throughout New Zealand uh, over many months. Um, what we may well do is just think about whether we do reset the clock for this cohort or whether or not um, you know, that's a necessary step. It's early days in that process. We're working closely with uh, the ministry and the, the DHB to come to the right conclusion. If you reset the clock, will you have to reset it from the last case of infection? I think it's early days to make that kind of determination. I think the key point... But that's the we'll potential, be- isn't it? Oh, we'll, just work that through. we'll just work that through with uh, with the right health authorities and we'll make the right decision with the information you, we need. You can't rule that out now, though, can you? Oh, I'm not ruling anything out. I mean, at the end of the day, we uh, we need to release people once they've met all those low health risk indicators. That's the most important point. Nobody will be leaving without that. If we need to reset the clock, that's exactly what we'll do. How many staff are you waiting on tests for? Uh, we've tested all of our staff. And, uh, and that's a normal process. We have a, a really rigorous staff testing regime in our facilities. They were all tested on Monday and Tuesday. And for those people who weren't working um, on those days, we've uh, uh, ensured that they've been tested today. So how many uh, are you waiting results on? Um, that will go through the health process. It takes 48 hours. What I can tell you is we have done the testing. And uh, once those results will come through, we'll, we'll know that. I don't, I don't have that detail to hand. How many staff but, are there at the facility? Um, again, that's not a number that's on the top of my head, but it's, uh, it would be in the vicinity of um, uh, between 150 to 200 staff, something like that. So when was your next arrival? The next plane of fishing crew was due to arrive when? And what does this mean? Because they are expected to stay in the same facility, aren't they? 
Yeah, so we will um, we were due to receive the second flight on the second of November, and um, and we're obviously working through really closely with all the uh, fishing companies. Um, they fully understand that safety and welfare comes first and foremost. If we need to make a delay, based on any operational decision, that's exactly what we'll do. So, what date was the second lot due to arrive? Second of November. Realistically, are you going to be clear in order to bring them in? I mean, I'd be um, I'd be speculating, but if you're asking me to make a, uh, a speculation, I'd say I don't think we would be. I think we'd be looking to make a delay, and that's a logical thing to do. We can uh, we can certainly easily make that make that happen. We're in really good communications with all necessary parties, and we'll just we'll just work that through. The key point is let's make sure we keep uh, everybody safe. And that is Air Commodore Darren Webb.